Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, hi everyone. Maybe uh, good morning, good afternoon, or and good evening, depending where you are. Welcome to today's Ijin Cafe. So the main topic of today's cafe is the knowledge management practice in disaster risk reduction, and we are mainly focused on the insights and experience from Asian and the Pacific countries. So, uh, the Ijin Cafe is like. Uh, organized by the IGN uh, event organizing committee and we have like IGN lectures, IGN cafe. So this is cafe is aims to pro, uh, link the the IG members and the researchers in a friendly and informal online setting. So by now we have already organized 13 cafes. So today we are going uh, Today is the 13th cafe, and today the topic is, is about the knowledge management because knowledge management plays a critical role in the rapid changing world and disaster and crisis can strike the society at any moment. So the knowledge management could and in composites of the acquisition, creation, sharing and utilization of knowledge and in the context of disaster risk reduction, the effective knowledge man management practice could contribute to the promoting the knowledge sharing, converting data into disaster risk reduction knowledge, or bridging the scientific and local knowledge, and also the live aging technology. And those we will discuss in the latest presentation and, and also discussions. So today, the main objectives of the cafe, including like we would like to understand what knowledge management is and how it could effective support disaster risk reduction. And we wish to share the cases and studies in disaster risk reduction in uh, the uh, practice of knowledge management in Asian and Pacific countries. So the invited speakers are going to share their experience and, and cases from their uh, from their uh, past experience. And the third objective is to identify the gaps and challenges between the theory and practice in addressing knowledge management for disaster risk reduction. And the fourth objective we would like to, in the end, hopefully we wish to provide rec uh, recommendations for the society in, in facing with the disaster risk and in in order to meet advanced disaster risk reduction. So today we will have the uh, presentations from three invited speakers. So again, thank you for Mizam, Liu and Anissa for accepting our invitation. So we will uh, have the, uh, we are expecting three wonderful presentations from three of them. And then we will open the floor to audience with the question and answer and uh, we, in the end, after we will wrap up and closing the, the uh, 13th cafe. So now I would like to introduce and invite our first speaker, Dr. Mizan Bisri. And uh, Mizan is the assistant professor at the Graduate, Graduate School of International Cooperation Studies, COP University. He is also the founder of CARI and he, the lead of the U Inspire. With more than 15 years of research and pro professional experience, he covers relevant area on disaster risk management, climate change adaptation, disaster education, and other uh, topics related to disaster re risk reduction, specifically on the Southeast Asian regions. So now, Mizan, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Juan Sensei, for the kind introduction. I will share my screen. All right. Is it uh, visible? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, today, I would like to share about our experience in developing and also maintaining, utilizing uh, Chari. Uh, so Chari is a 
is uh, an Indonesian word and it's abbreviation, uh, Cerdas Antisipasi Risiko Bencana, or in English, the official translation is Intelligently Anticipating Disaster Risk. <laughs> Cari is also uh, the Indonesian word for search or to search. So um, from the very beginning, our aspiration is how we can provide a new way to share knowledge. And especially we we specifically targeting uh, scientific knowledge that hopefully can add values to disaster risk reduction, policy making, and also practices in Indonesia. I will share this video, just a quick uh, introduction about Chari, just a moment. Can you hear the audio as well? Yes, I, I can. So. I want to see okay, thank you. Risk management. Knowledge. With Chari, you can get Kalakas knowledge in your area in no time. Or we can help you to create one. By having the right combination of fundamental and novel knowledge, you can make better decisions to accelerate the resilient development of the community. Chari was born as a research and ICT-based social enterprise providing end-to-end -end disaster knowledge management services in Indonesia and beyond. With the literal meaning of search, we facilitate your needs to access the most suitable knowledge that can address your challenges. Using our knowledge.chari.bencana.id, Anyone is able to search not only the genetic disaster risk information about Indonesia, but also to access locally relevant science and technologies that can help them reduce the risk in their targeted area. Protect assets and be prepared for emergency situations while maintaining business continuity, and even to recover faster after a disaster. You can also subscribe to our free monthly Indonesia Disaster Knowledge Update that shows the insights, pattern, and strength of disaster knowledge based on the selected latest issues. We save your time to synthesize and update the knowledge for your initiatives. In collaboration with Chari Team, we are preparing future professionals and thought leaders in resilient and sustainable development. we understand while big data is enriching and actionable information is critical it is a knowledge-based investment and development that is indispensable for genuine resilience so what are you searching for let's collaborate to create a resilient and sustainable development of our society So that's our story in, in Chari. Uh, I think we are uh, entering our fifth years now, but how it started actually. So it started out of my postdoc uh, project research at the time at the United Nations University and the University of Tokyo. Uh, basically, I'm looking into the network politics of science and policy. So in essence, how a network of actors, discourse, policy, and knowledge really uh, link one to another. Uh, one of the motivation, uh, how, we, how we started it is um, I myself and the founder of Chari, uh, both of us were responding to various disasters in Indonesia in 2018. We have Lombok earthquake at that time. We had Central Sulawesi earthquake and tsunami. And also we have um, atypical tsunami in the coast of Banten. And one of our findings and realization while responding to that disaster is that why is that often uh, time and time again, every time there is a disaster, there is always a blame gaming, asking where is the knowledge, why we don't know that there is a past study in that area and etc. And of course, uh, as a researcher looking into network, um, I was fascinated and exploring that model, but at the same time realized maybe social network analysis, discourse network analysis, and also a knowledge network is not enough. Maybe there should be something else that can help the audience, policymaker, 
can quickly access the locally relevant knowledge in in Indonesia. So that's the the keyword, uh, locally relevant knowledge that can really be useful for a policymaker investors to create something out of it. So that's why we we compare what's available out there, Prevention Web, ASEAN Science Based uh, Platform, Red Cross Library, and compare with others like how uh, people in the agricultural economic share their knowledge, how people in the medical science, their uh, laboratory experiment in Bensai, and how there is a ris uh, there is a platform who provide uh, research only about Indonesia, but across sectors. And we also think how Gojek, Grab, and also Uber create their engine. And uh, the inspiration is that perhaps we should combine disaster a live disaster research repository from Scopus, Web of Science, Directory of Open Access, and its power behind that through Scientometric, and visualize them in a form of a map. So in essence, Chari is a combination kind of like a Google Scholar and Google Map for disaster uh, knowledge in Indonesia. And of course, from there, it's get uh, traction, and of course, we push it to be featured as well in the status of science and technology in DRR. Uh, we try to combine, so this is our approach. We combine, of course, we understand data, information, knowledge, and wisdom management is different, but interlink one to another. Uh, in Chari, we are adopting uh, Nonaka Sensei's uh, four aspects of this knowledge management practices. So knowledge management should be clear in terms of its people. So who are actually whose knowledge and for whom and how it should be managed. The process oriented, what what piece of information, data, and uh, within the knowledge product should be um, should be tailored and synthesized. What sort of technology should be deployed? Is it repository? Is it visualization? Is it a data visualization? Is it a uh, web scrapping and etc. And ultimately, there is should be a specific goal uh, for the uh, certain knowledge management practice. So in our context, from the very beginning, and we are understand, we often get this question, oh, Mizan, why Chari only uh, manage uh, knowledge from scientific publication? And then I mentioned, yes, uh, that is our limitation, but at, that is also our intention from the very beginning, because we want to make sure that the knowledge that empowered, inspired, and informed policymaking and investment in Indonesia is something that's genuinely coming out of science and not hoax. It's not uh, to widespread uh, misinformation and etc. And the idea is that uh, we can, of course, not reinvent the wheel. If the knowledge is already out, already out there, use it for policymaking, use it for investment and etc. But at the same time, we want to make sure that everything that we do is scientifically and conceptually sound, fostering uh, co-creation, and also it should be pragmatically implementable. So from there, of course, we develop uh, our engine, and this is already our four, uh, third version of caribencana.id, so knowledge.caribencana.id. And everyone, we uh, harvest the knowledge harvested in our engine and create a synthesis in the form of Indonesia Disaster Knowledge Update. So every month, we release a trend report, pattern report that showcase the a pattern of a disaster related knowledge and is in a certain uh, specific subject matter, be it about community base, about tsunami, about disaster education, or even how disaster link with human mobility and human rights in Indonesia. In essence, is to really show the, the pattern, the trends, and of course, to show the gaps, which area in Indonesia lacking for knowledge and should be invested more in terms of scientific and research activities and so on. This is the highlights uh, of the reach of uh, our engine and also Indonesia disaster knowledge update in last year. Uh, I think it's okay when we compare with a similar platform and engine. But I think uh, Juan Sensei mentioned earlier what, what we want to get out of this uh, e Dream Cafe is also to discuss what are the gaps. So even, on, even after Chari entering its uh, fifth year, we can also see that, of course, the utilization of our engine, our ITCO, is still mostly concentrated in, uh, you know, big industrial areas in Indonesia, in Java, some in Aceh, uh, North Sumatra, uh, surprisingly, of course, in Papua, but of course, in other area, it's it's less so. And uh, this image is uh, the our users from last week. So, of course, uh, every week we track who is actually using our engine, who is actually uh, spewing our ITCO, 
and of course uh, not only from Indonesia but also from uh, other country from the US North America uh, China Japan uh, South Asia Australia so hopefully this is really uh, making a difference and uh, helping if not the people directly helping policy maker investor to really utilize knowledge for uh, policy creation for disaster risk reduction and resilience building um the, the this image as i mentioned is from last week but i can mention that every week we see this and the pattern is uh, somewhat similar so these dots is uh, the frequently uh, utilize uh, the frequent uh, user of our engine our operation model is of course oh, by having this knowledge management engine hopefully actors aspiring to build their resilience can identify problems and challenges uh, for uh, that should be solved for resilience building in their community and chari provide either a research products and services uh, such as sterilometry research or capacity building or customize an on premise knowledge management system so we can also develop knowledge management system for something else for food science for i don't know agriculture health and etc but at the, at the end of the day it is uh, working towards resilience and sustainable development and uh, this is use case number one. so through our search engine and the monthly indonesia disaster knowledge uh, update when we meet with stakeholders who have this desire and needs for creating policy or investment planning we supply them with the knowledge that already synthesized and local either locally relevant or sectoral relevant for their activities in the short amount uh, in entering our fifth year i think we have completed uh, more than uh, 40 uh, studies for various development partners uh, in indonesia and southeast asia Use case number two is, of course, transferring our knowledge management know-how in terms of developing web-based uh, engine uh, or, or web-based system to various digitalization uh, efforts. So we create as an environment knowledge update, uh, disaster history portal of Indonesia, or Admir work program uh, monitoring and evaluation system that uh, those are the, those are system that are leveraging our know-how in terms of information and knowledge management. Uh, another uh, use case is about how to utilize uh, knowledge to really empower people working in and for resilience building. So through the knowledge that we collected, we harvest and synthesize them to support creating a curriculum for capacity building, such as, for instance, uh, this is one uh, collaboration with the Conversation Indonesia to create a science leadership collaborative program that basically supporting early career researchers in Indonesia to strive further in uh, for for uh, sectors uh, working in uh, resilience building in Indonesia and among others. Use case number four, of course, uh, knowledge is also important and should be utilized for science communication. So uh, through the knowledge that we harvest, uh, we are striving to also pushing the utilization of knowledge for fighting misinformation, misconception, and various challenges in terms of science communication. So as much as possible, we utilize science for producing information, education, and communication materials, either those that are distributed through our own uh, social media channels or from uh, other partners' um, products. I will then, uh, as my final two slides, I will just give uh, two uh, in-depth uh, examples about the utilization of knowledge management in practice that uh, utilizing a Chari engine. So for instance, in this context, uh, knowledge management uh, support from Chari can accelerate the process, shortening the process for feasibility study for forecast-based early action in two areas in Indonesia, is Jakarta and also Alor. Usually feasibility study for this kind of forecast-based early action programming took at least uh, six months. But by utilizing the knowledge discovery through Chari Engine and our in-depth understanding on the knowledge pattern on early warning system, and recently we released an ITCO on forecast-based early action, we can shorten the process uh, from six months to two months so that our uh, partners uh, can quickly uh, create a program that then uh, producing or providing a positive uh, uh, impact to the two communities in East uh, Jakarta and also in Alor in uh, East Nusa Tenggara. Uh, another example, for instance, uh, is that to branching out. Sometimes people want to know how the knowledge in disaster studies link with human rights or human mobility. 
other cases how the advancement on disaster science connect with environmental management and can support uh, nature-based solution programming in Indonesia. Or another case, we support uh, uh, finding linkages between advancement in disaster science with uh, coral reef protection and with insurance. So by utilizing uh, this kind of understanding, looking into the pattern in terms of geographics, the trend of the pattern of uh, research and how it links from the hazard to specific subject matter, to disaster management phase and to another framework, then we can provide information to um, our stakeholder what should be what is the pain point to really either producing knowledge or utilizing knowledge. And for instance, in this context, uh, uh, in support to Roll Wallenberg Institute of Humanitarian Law uh, in Sweden, we use uh, we utilize our know-how in terms of knowledge synthesization knowledge synthesizing for creating a bibliometric analysis for the nexus of climate change, human mobility, and human rights in Asia Pacific. So it's uh, showing the potential of this type of uh, knowledge engine for branching out across subject matter and also across region. So I think, uh, yeah, that's that's about it. My 15 minutes uh, quick intervention uh, to trigger a uh, discussion in this cafe about uh, knowledge management uh, practice in uh, in one of the Asia Pacific countries in this context, Indonesia, and also some of its experience in uh, Southeast Asian countries. Thank you very much uh, for your kind in invitation, uh, Juan Sensei and uh, colleagues from Kyoto University. Thank you. Thank you, Mita Sensei, for your very wonderful presentation and the uh, introduction of Chari and its application. So uh, now we would like to uh, we will open the we will open the floor for questions after all the uh, presentations. Now we would like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Liu Zichita. So, uh, Dr. Liu is currently an assistant technical staff member at Kyoto University. His academic interests, including new culture anthropology, specifically focusing on the anthropology of disaster, history, resilience, and rehabilitation in the context of climate change. So he has conducted extensive field work in water-related disaster-prone areas of Sri Lanka. Uh, thank you very much again for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your invitation and I'm very delighted to talk here. And uh, my individual talk, like uh, last week, I completely finished my doctoral thesis, and I I I think I may I think I obtained my PhD uh, degree. But anyway, I will start my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my title is the from creating resilient societies to caring resilient societies. The purpose of the this presentation is to re interpret the concept of the collectivity found in the inter-disaster phase context using the laws of care, particularly by analyze, analyzing it to perspective that do not solely view individuals as agents who choose their actions or responsibilities. It aims to provide a new perspective on the pluralism of actors involved in recovery and inter-disaster phase. Also, this discussion may offer then an alternative or plural uh, perspective of the uh, diversity of the recovery, uh, such as the housing choose, choice, or intention of the self-determination de uh, in the disaster phase. Well, what people involved in contemporary events related to disaster and recovery seek is not just an understanding of the case causes, system probabilities, and solutions such as why, how, and how it's the causability and how to resolve. Instead, uh, what's crucial is in the consideration of the confusion and bewilderment that arising during disaster resp responses to critical situations and imagination when facing them, the, such as the disa hard disasters. Therefore, a shift in perspective is required in spite emphasizing internal, understa internal understanding rather than external rationality or value judgment, such as why choose to live in a dangerous area, 
or how to minimize the risk. This shift is focusing on understanding what practice uh, allows individuals to continue living, even at the cost of the taking on the risk and responsibilities. And the um, choice of the residents in disaster prone areas and the resulting the actions can be challenging, particularly for vulnerable individuals. Uh, promoting the goal of the society and invisible individuals coexisting with nature and disasters within a relationship that places that uh, the burden of the self self responsibility on the individual may lead to normalizations of the victims continuing to live in high risk areas as if it were an accepted practice. However, the continuing the to live in the uh, uh, sorry. However, the role of the individuals as an agent in creating collectivity through their choices and intentions in spatial temporal overlap of recovery and future disasters has not yet been uh, sufficiently examined. So what does the, it mean when non-human or human entities are, are also involved in the decision-making process? As a hint, I will uh, focus on the logic of care which has gained attention in anthropology in recent years. Animali Mo is the Dutch uh, medical anthropologist. Mo is considered as a post uh, actor network theory, a so-called ANT scholar who, had a, uh, who has uh, extended ANT ideas and explored topics related to healthcare, technology, and feminism. Her, her uh, 2006 work, The Lodge of Care, shed light on the lived uh, life experiences of diabetes uh, patients in Dutch hospital and the diverse uh, practice of care, including healthcare professionals, tools, and technologies. She accomplished he, uh, this through uh, patient and of patient observ uh, participant observation and interviews. In following, uh, I will provide an overview of Mo's logic of care and logic of care of to broaden uh, interpretation of agency in, in the context of recovery. While these logics are not explicitly defined in the in the book with a single sentence, but I will explore uh, them by ex examining uh, by I will explore in this context. Logic refers to some commonalities or attitudes that emerges from local and diverse pr uh, practices. So this is very uh, conceptual or uh, philosophical ideas. Um, first, uh, the logic, logic of choice refers to the ideas that individual possess unique will and desires and the uh, consequences of the their choices at a given moment are considered their personal responsibility. Such as in healthcare, examples such as the informed consent and abortion are clear in, uh, illustrations. Such as the specialists uh, give some ideas, such as the this is the risk, this is the uh, medicines. So you have to uh take this and or you may will die or you have some more high risk uh, uh problems so in these cases experts provide information and patients can choose based on the information however the responsibility for the outcomes and actions rests heavily on the patients the logic of choice illustrates that choice operates along a linear timeline. Viewing this, uh, viewing in it this way, we have uh, we have lived in a society that praises a uh, logic of choices, which demands individual decision making and assign responsibility for the outcomes of to the individual. On the other hand, the logic of care refers to practice that involves sustained adjustment uh, tailored to uniqueness and specificity of individual lives aimed at improving their 
the person's uh, situation or preventing it from worsening. While the logic uh, choice creates the branching points with a single process, process ultimately assigning responsibility to the individual, but I don't, but uh, the logic care, according to the mole, involves a continuous uh, trial and errors process to improve the situation, engaging in daily adjustment that may include innovation and failures. In other words, the logic of care does not presume normative normative I ideas of betterment for from the outset. Instead, it adopts uh, practical styles essentials for seeking better life collectively through mutual assistance when situation demand a clear and better choice. What if we consider most insight in uh, insight uh, primarily deri derived from her research in healthcare setting in the context of the logic care during the post-disaster period or inter-disaster phase. To preserve community auto autonomy uh, and respect the value judgment of those who choose in living in high-risk area, disaster-prone areas, it is essential to think from the perspective of what people desire not what the government or the market provides. Understanding factors uh, such as the uh, specific live con living conditions, needs, and existing human and technological resources. Recognizing individuals' judgment and autonomy values can be seen as a better stand standard to support the, the diversity of recovery. Furthermore, what what if we replace the subject of the logic of care, which is a uh, for a supposed uh, fragile and unpredictable body or communities or with the life of people, tools, technology, and system during the post disaster or inter disaster phase recovery period or the uncertainty of the uh, inter disaster phases in healthcare settings? The logic of care emphasizing continually caring for the body and adjustment adjusting it toward a better state rather than control, controlling it. This requires constant adjustment for everything, including body's health related to tools, machines, or other peoples. On the other hand, when it comes to disaster-related care and uh, the logic of care in disaster case, it's, it is a, collect, a collaborative uh, effort involving not only the relationship between the caregiver and the recipient, but also various stakeholders, such as family members, experts, volunteers, government entities, people who have experienced the same disasters or, um, or expert, uh, predictive and warning technologies, hazard map, locations, like a temporary and recovery housing in disaster prone areas and natural environment or resources, evacuation recovery and reconstruction for disaster victims are not solely individual responsibilities. To pursue better outcomes, it is crucial to repeatedly incorporate a practice that transform all resources and systems into different systems including family, community, relatives, support networks of those who have experienced the same disasters, prediction and warning systems, technologies, tool, systems, and housing. It might be considered the key uh, to generate better norms, such as not only to making or creating resilient societies newly or renewally, but carrying the societies for patchworking the societies or actors, including humans and non-humans, non such as nature or technologies, for carrying others and carrying the resilience. This is a very conceptual ideas for conceptual ideas based on my field work from the Sri Lanka and Kyushu regions in Japan, which also uh, affected by the hard rain disasters recently. I couldn't have some much time to talk here to 
uh, talk details about what they had happened. But you can imagine about the logic of care. If you see or observe, observe or feel some hesitation or some feelings for uh, the uh, affected communities or areas, it might be help for thinking or thinking the framework to what is the resilience or how to create a resilience. And in my words, like caring the resilient societies, not creating, because the caring means how we touch work others, such as the humans or non-humans or other um, technologies, shelters, housing, resources, or systems or institution, institutions, institutional systems, but might be support the actions and intentions of the uh, disaster survivors living in the disaster inter disaster phases and the cities, I think. Well, it's very short, um, my uh, presentation and my, idea, my ideas. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much for listening for my presentation. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Dr. Liu Zichita for your wonderful presentation and the introduction of the concept for logic of care and also the experience of uh, experience and insights from the real world implementation. So uh, now we would like to invite the third speaker of the cafe, Dr. Anissa Cheyanti. So Dr. Anissa is currently working as assistant professor of uh, at the disaster and climate risk governance for sustainability at the environmental governance group, uh, Utrecht University at the Netherlands. So her research focuses on addressing water related disaster in coastal and delta regions, especially in Asian countries, for example, Indonesia and India and others. And her focus uh, potentially in the social capital and ecosystem approach and community-based disaster risk governance. So thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation. And we now the floor is yours, please, Anissa. Thank you so much um, for the invitation to speak at this um, event, uh, a dream cafe. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to try my best to share my screen, but I don't know if you can see it um, like this. Does this work? Now it's the uh, not the main screen. The yeah, okay. swap this place maybe in the top. Like yeah. This? Yeah. Great. Great. Thank yeah. You. Okay. I'm using a new device, so it's uh, it's sometimes it's a, a tricky um, technology, let's say. Um, yeah, so thanks a lot for the invitation. So today I'm going to just share some experience, maybe exploration about the, um, it's not necessarily a new topic for me, but I've been moving towards research, uh, focusing on transdisciplinary approaches. And of course, my background is very much on disaster and climate risk uh, governance. Um, but um, at this point of my career, I'm trying to look into different methods and ways to actually um, really make change on the ground in terms of improving disaster resilience. And I feel like transdisciplinary approaches have a lot of potential to do that. So yeah, just bear with me. Maybe there are some new concepts. I think it's good also to just discuss them and get your insights about, about these concepts. Yeah, so a bit of introduction about myself um, soon, and then also I will discuss about the transdisciplinary approach and also the value of transdisciplinary approach, um, why we need transdisciplinary approach for disaster risk reduction, a uh, glimpse to case studies uh, from my um, past research in Vietnam and India, and some uh, reflection on lessons learned. Um, I would like to also highlight a bit of a thinking exercise because again, it's a new field. 
that I would like to explore and get more insights from you. And um, lastly, I will share some resources that maybe could also help people who wants to do transdisciplinary approach for their research or their project uh, from our own transdisciplinary field guide at Utrecht University. Yeah, but first, I think um, um, the moderator have or has already uh, introduced me quite well. Um, so uh, I'm a basically human geographer, um, but um, I'm also studying uh, human geography and the relations with uh, social science perspective, governance theories, environmental governance. Um, empirically, I'm working on cases in coastal and delta areas uh, in, in Asia. Right, so we'll start with transdisciplinary science. I'm not sure how many of you have been following the discussion on this. Basically, it's a new, it's not new, but maybe um, newly framed as a, as a groundbreaking uh, concept that really trying to move away from the tradition of um, science, uh, ex exclusivity of science, where we work in a disciplinary um, uh, base, let's say, moving towards multidisciplinary, so working between different disciplines like physical geographer, working with anthropology, uh, anthropologist um, and social scientists, et cetera, towards common goal, and then moving towards interdisciplinarity where the boundary of disciplines is not very clear anymore. So it's more about the common goal of doing science for a common purpose. And now we're moving towards transdisciplinary science, which is really about that um, this recipro uh, reciprocal engagement between academic and societal stakeholders. The aim is really to co produce knowledge um, and uh, solving pressing societal challenges um, with the characteristic of complex real life uh, problems. There are different values of transdisciplinary approach. Uh, for academics, but also societal stakeholders. Some of them um, I will highlight. Uh, well, you can see the, the list, of course, on the screen. Uh, it really tries to um, push academics to think about societal impact, um, collaboration with new partners, um, uh, getting fresh ideas beyond our bubble in front of our laptop and in front of um, reading uh, journal articles. Also, as a reality check, testing and experimenting our theories in practice, building new capacities, and maybe also career possibilities for societal stakeholders is about improving the understanding of of uh, solving challenges in in different way, um, capacity building, and also networking um, for policymakers. Maybe it's about improving services to to civil society, etc. So there are a lot of values of tra doing transdisciplinary approach. So again, I think the key point here is that transdisciplinary science really challenged this idea of exclusivity of science, that science as uh, the only type of knowledge that would help to, um, to deal with, with uh, problems, including disaster, um, anthropogenic issues, gl uh, global environmental challenges, et cetera. Right, so why do we need transdisciplinary approach to reduce disaster risk? because we need to understand disaster risk as, as a wicked, multifaceted and uncertain problems. It's very dynamic, it's very complex, diverse and also interscale. Maybe some of you also have heard about the concept of systemic risk, that everything is interrelated to the point that you don't know exactly what's the root cause of the problem and what's the consequences and how it actually interrelated and the feedback mechanism, et cetera. So it, to understand that, we, it requires diversity of knowledge and also integration. Uh, and there is, of course, um, related to wicked problems, there is no one size uh, fit all solution. Uh, there is no panacea. So we need um, all uh, type of knowledge uh, on the table, trying to understand how we can deal with disaster risks in the short and, uh, and the longer term. Yeah, so moving on to the case study of um, Vietnam. So I'm, I, I was doing research during the pandemic together with colleagues from Vietnam National University in two areas in Cà Mau and Ben Trip province in Vietnam. Uh, in terms of disaster risk, they are prone to er erosion, subsidence, and also the problem is, is really this in increasing uh, vulnerability of disaster. Um, um, especially when we look into the socioeconomic vulnerabilities, 
Um, and it challenged them in terms of looking into a different, uh, 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 um, a longer type, uh, long term risk like climate change and sea, le sea level rise. And to deal with this problem, there are a combination of technocratic and structural measures. If you look into the coastal risk area, uh, some of the measures uh, includes the hard, the building of hard infrastructure like dikes and seawalls. But also in terms of the green approach, um, they're using the surfaces of mangrove as a natural barrier for um, coastal, um, reducing coastal risk. Uh, and what I studied exactly is this increasing role of international NGOs trying to promote the ecosystem-based uh, approach using mangrove um, by, for example, initiating a livelihood advancement program, um, trying to uh, implement certain policy um, and also regulation, initiate regulation, like for example, payment for ecosystem services to help community and also policymaker to, to equip them with the right tool and capacity to conserve mangrove ecosystem, uh, which also proven to have co-benefit when we talk about disaster risk is not only reducing risk of disaster, but it's also improving um, uh, the livelihood of the local people, biodiversity, uh, etc. So what is exactly the scope of the study then? So we're trying to understand how um, boundary organizations or so international NGO, we define them as boundary organization. And in itself, they are actually a transdisciplinary actors because they are trying to bridge knowledge from the practice, from the science, but also from the community and policymakers. So they're a perfect example of a boundary uh, of transdisciplinary actors. So we're looking into literatures, what are the success conditions for boundary organization to implement ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction in this case. So um, there are five um, elements or aspects. First is about knowledge-related conditions. Second is about network-related conditions, resource-related condition, um, strategies to implement um, uh, EBA by uh, international organization and condition related to the context of the receiving nations. Because again, the resources and knowledge come from actually international organization where they try to implement them in, in Vietnam. So what's the um, result? So we found that the program that has been implemented are actually quite good. Um, when we look into different aspects, we realize that um, access to knowledge, for example, is, is really uh, good. Um, because they can actually bridge, again, this different uh, type of expertise. They know the local community, they have access to policy making, they have access to scientists, ecologists, for example, that can help them to really be targeting to, to, to aim for the success of this project. Um, and also the salience, credibility and legitimate knowledge that they have. Uh, using scientific arguments is one of the um, success factor, let's say. I think if you heard a presentation from Masmi Zan just now, really that's also the core of, of Chari, for example. And it's, it, it is one of the success condition for, for this type of approach. However, um, maybe I will not go into each of the aspects, but just try to, to focus more on the knowledge related condition. Um, I think what is missing in terms of the Vietnamese case study is really about uh, the changing and the dynamic, because when we talk about disaster risk, the risks are changing. And again, it's a systemic um, type of um, risk, let's say. Um, for example, human capacity can be increased, but uh, we don't know what's the condition in terms of geo geophysical threat in the future, etc. So the, the dynamic of knowledge become very, very much important when we look into the, the long-term sustainability um, um, aspect, let's say. Um, and maybe the other things that I want to highlight in this slide is really this um, importance of having this uh, goodness of fit of the context. So what type of knowledge really that is needed for a certain um, case or certain nation with different socio-political contexts, et cetera. Right, so this is just um, uh, another case that I wanted to highlight, but just very briefly, because I'm, I'm also mindful about the time. So another case study I've done for my PhD research is this Pichavaram area of Pichavaram mangrove forest in Tamil Nadu. So um, the mangrove there really helps community to survive during the Indian Ocean tsunami. Of course, there's a lot of debates how mangrove can be effective for this type of sudden and uh, massive hazard uh, disaster like, like tsunami. Um, 
Yeah, but um, focusing on the role of the boundary organization instead of international organization for India, national and local NGOs are, are were very, very strong in terms of their presence to promote ecosystem-based approach and also very strong in terms of um, advocating for policy measure and implementation to conserve mangrove, especially after the, the Indian Ocean tsunami. And we found that, that the success factor is really about leveraging the local knowledge. So when we re revisit the case of Vietnam, there's this uh, yellow, um, uh, how do you call it? yellow aspect about the fitness, good enough, goodness of fits of context for the case of India, because uh, the knowledge and actors that are actually working on the on the area are from there. So they know a lot about the area. They know about the context. They're very much more closer to the local communities. Um, um, and having this um, unified um, spiritual value um, showing or believing that mangrove as a spiritual being then, and their protector. So they have to also protect mangrove in that sense. So a bit of lessons learned from these two cases, very short, of course. Um, yeah, reducing disaster re risk require diversity of actors, their knowledge and perspective. So we need transdisciplinary approaches. Uh, the transdisciplinary approaches can manifest in different forms, starting from archiving knowledge, active collaboration, um, and also reflections. Um, so there are different kind of la um, ladders of, of um, at participation and also the way we can implement transitive approaches. Of course, communicating is one way, but then the question is, can we also involve uh, knowledge actively in our research and our scientific thinking, let's say. Um, and boundary organizations such as uh, NGOs could help uh, to take the role as boundary spanner, bridging knowledge of the community and other stakeholders. However, it's important to have this ownership and goodness of fit with socio-political context. So it's not only transferring knowledge, exporting knowledge, but also really thinking about how it can be implemented um, in different contexts. Uh, important question, I think, um, that we need to reflect on is whose knowledge is legitimate and for what purpose? Of course, as scientists and researchers, you say that scientific paper, knowledge from scientific paper is the um, on top of the hierarchy, but I think um, as a researcher, but also when it comes to university as a as a system, should we should really envision more active role. So moving from the mode of this ivory tower mode to engage with um, stakeholders, redefining what is actually scientific excellence. If it's about disasters, then it's about resilience of the people, and in that sense, we have to really. Um, get a lot, uh, many diverse knowledge on board and, and work with it. And uh, young scientists and professionals, I think many of you are, can take the role as boundary spanner. And I know that some of you are already doing that, connecting science and policy and also connecting with the society. I think that's also something that is important to highlight. Thinking exercise, something that maybe you can think after this presentation. So how far do we as researcher and university and society wants to open up science and society to codefine research and education. Um, again, it's knowledge is politics. So it's about positionality at the end, of course, um, but it's a question. How can we do stakeholder engagement in inclusive and, and meaningful way while leaving no one behind? It's a very difficult question because what is in what is inclusive, what is justice? How can we strike the balance between inclusive stakeholder engagement with scientific rigor, which is still a very highly debated subject? Okay, so this is a resource that I wanted to share with you. So we developed a transdisciplinary field guide from Utrecht University. So I'm currently the focal point for this, uh, but it will change soon, I believe. Uh, but I would recommend you to look into these resources um, because there are so many things that maybe can be helpful. So about definition of transdisciplinary trans research, how to do it in practice, some of the field story and methods and resources and uh, frequently asked question. We are also developing um, a page on transdisciplinary education. Hopefully it will come up soon. Right, so with this, I will end my presentation and I look forward for this uh, the discussion. How do you stop it? The sharing? Yes. Thank you very much, Anissa, for the wonderful presentation for the uh, presenting the 
pieces from different countries for the how the transdisciplinary approaches can lead to comprehensive solutions in the for the addressing complex disaster risks. So thank you very much for three speakers for the wonderful presentations and